Okay, so we have two past four. Um, I guess it's a great time to start. So we're really happy to have you all here for the next Max Planck Sustainable Sustainability Seminar. And today we're going to hear from actually four speakers about their experiences and what they experienced, learned, and figured out at COP26 in Glasgow this year. Um, yeah, I don't. I think I probably don't need to say much about uh, the COP26 itself, and uh, maybe they will give a small introduction to what it is. But uh, everybody probably knows that it was the the big meeting just happening a couple of weeks ago, and we had some observers from the Max Planck Society being there, observing what happened. And um, yeah, now they're going to report uh, about their their experiences. But before we start, I would hand over quickly to Jakob, who would uh, like to make some uh, advertisement for the sustainability network of the Max Planck Society. Yeah, thank you very much, Jan. And um, we are very happy to see um, you here in our seminar. And um, before we start, I would like to briefly advertise our Max Planck Sustainability Network. If you're interested in our work, you can either subscribe to our newsletter or you can register also as a member of our um, sustainability network in order to do this. Um, go on our website and then you have on the menu you have join us and um, here you can either um, subscribe to the newsletter of the Max Planck Sustainability Network or you can also register um, as a member of the Sustainability Network. Both options are actually only possible for affiliates of the Max Planck Society which means either PhD students, employees, etc who are working in the, Max Planck, uh, uh, in the Max Planck Society. If you are not a Max Planck affiliate, we also have um, a newsletter for externals. And I just see that it's not online yet. I will uh, make it online during the seminar. And you can also subscribe to a um, to newsletter for um, externals. And with this, I will hand back to Jan. Thank you very much. So this will be then in the second, uh commercial block at the end of the seminar. Um, yeah, so with this, we're really happy um, to have four members of the observers with us. So it's Benjamin, JD, Jiming, and uh, Thomas. Two of them have been in the first week and two of them in the second week. So we, we cover the whole time frame of the COP26. And I guess all of them will have a little bit different experiences and different impressions from COP26, which they are going to share with us now. So first I will hand over to Benjamin. He will give a small presentation and then the others will act on their, with their experiences uh, after this. And then we open for um, a small discussion. So everybody is invited to ask questions to the four of them. For this, you can either use the question and answer bubble on the bottom. So please don't use the normal chat because there it's quite easy that questions get lost somewhere. Therefore we have this special Q&A bubble, or sometimes it's also F&A. Um, to just use this, type in your question. You can also upvote questions from other people, or you can raise your hand. We will unmute you and you can ask your question directly live um, to one or all of them. Yeah, so thank you very much for being with us, sharing with us your experiences, and I'll hand over to Benjamin for the presentation. Thanks, Jan. Um, thanks for the very kind introduction. Um, I'll share my screen now with you and then um, also uh, say a few words of um, how we thought that this, um, this session should go. Um, you, everyone listening in today will likely have heard about COP26, um, was this global event um, early November in Glasgow. That was the 26th conference of the parties of the UNFC, um, UNFCCC, and the framework on um, climate change. And um, what we want to do is uh, share a bit our experience um, observing for the Max Planck Society at COP26. And what's maybe most important to us is that there's not just a single COP26, single climate conference, but there's, there's many things going on at the same time at this venue. And the experience that you would have going there varies a lot depending on what you see, where you go, who you talk to. And that's why it's, um, it's great that actually four of us will um, be uh, able to share their thoughts and experiences. And I'm just supposed to give you like an, an initial introduction and um, initial um, 
no, it's some some pictures and just maybe some something to get going, and then um, the others will give their views, um, which might differ, uh, which might align. So I guess this is um, something that's very interesting about COP that it's so diverse. Um, let me briefly mention who are the people involved. So um, when I say we the observers, um, and actually um, a big thanks. Big shout out goes to um, Dr. Tom Sparks, who is not in this uh, in this panel discussion today, but has been responsible for making it all work. Um, and if you have any question about the delegation at COP26, um, if you're interested in, in going to one of the next conferences, you should definitely get in touch with him. Um, and um, I think from all of us, we should also thank him again, because he was basically making this all possible in the background. And then there is um, five of us who are actually um, in person uh, in Glasgow. And um, if you want to get in touch with any of us, um, I just I just put the names, but um, you'll find our email addresses um, easily. And um, uh, so Christine, she um, uh, she was actually the head of our delegation. She was here for two weeks. And um, Thomas and you, uh, JD and um, myself we were there for one week each. JD and I were then in the last and the last week of COP, and um, Thomas and Ming in the first week. And um, really glad that um, us four are here today. So you're very very welcome to ask questions to us about whatever you um, whatever comes to your mind. And um, then what I want to share with you is basically some. I mean, showing to showing to you what COP is um, a little bit to to our eyes, to my eyes, um, through my eyes, um, to give you an impression um, of the things that you might not um, have learned already from reading a couple of news articles. Because our goal today is not to reproduce um, what I mean, what you might have read already. There was extended news coverage already. Um, and there's also um, a written report from us that's being prepared at the moment um, that you will be able to read in the end. Um, instead, what we want to do is just very informally um, show you what COP is like. So maybe first thing to, to understand is there's um, uh, at, uh, at, at COP, I mean, it's a conference of parties. So that's um, where all the um, all the part, uh, I mean, all the conference parties. That that means all the countries come together, and the main um, setting where they do that that's a plenary. And this is how it looks like for us when we're back in the plenary. You will have um, the big stage where then the presidency of COP will guide through the proceedings, and um, uh, all the country parties. Um, I mean, country parties being present, it's it's nearly two hundred countries which are there, and so in that sense, the plenary really gives. Kind of like a unique, um, unique place for all of the countries that are present there to discuss, to raise concerns. And in the background, you will see there are, um, I mean, there's just I mean, one one sign on the left, but these are all observer organizations. Some um, some are UN organizations, um, but um, I mean, we uh, with the Max Planck Society were organized in the Ringo constituency, so that's um, research independent, independent non-governmental organizations. And there's um, there's a couple of other ones, one um, um, addressing mainly youth and addressing um, mainly trade organization, business, and so on. So they're organized. Um, and observers then have the possibility to, to listen in. Um, they can also, especially through the constituencies, raise their voice and um, say something, but then at the end, it's it's a conference of parties, not of, of, of observers. Um, but it gives us to, the opportunity as an observer to really be present and witness firsthand um, at least some of the um, proceedings going on. So that's, that's a plenary, um, so that you've seen it. Um, and then there's oh, um, another uh, setting where observers are present. And this is, this is kind of how, how it looks like. These are the informal negotiations. So on the plenary, um, I mean, more like the overall um, progress of the, of, the, of the COP will be announced and what the current draft situation is, where 
where the presidency of the COP um, might announce where, where currently maybe the, the critical points are that um, leave to be discussed. And this is one more informal level of negotiations. So in this um, in this setup, the countries will discuss, um, for uh, say, adaptation. So I think actually this was um, te technology um, transfer. Um, this uh, I mean uh, this meeting there. So um, there the countries negotiate a little bit more in detail what, what's going on. This is something where observers are generally uh, allowed, but then these negotiations can be closed for observers. And then um, observers <laughs> may be asked to leave and um, then it's not um, open to observers anymore. Uh, I think the plenaries, all, I think all of them are actually streamed also to the public. So, um, but these, these negotiations were not, they're available to observers. Um, so, our, um, and, and you see there's, um, I mean, basically this is still like a very large room and, um, but more technical details might be discussed. Um, and there's always, um, I mean, basically here at the head of the room, there's uh, some country uh, co-facilitating um, for the presidency of COP. Um, there's, there's another level of, inform, of, of a more, even more informal discussions um, where observers are not present. And that's of course when, when things get really difficult to negotiate. Um, and that might be um, either in um, discussions among just, I mean, few countries or even in hotel lobbies and so on. And this is of course something that as an observer, you will not, it will not be announced, right? So um, that's where we would not be present. Um, and so there are these different layers of the negotiation negotiations going on. And um, this is some of the, I mean, some of the uh, negotiations that, that you're able to see and witness and see where, where, where the problems are a bit. And um, what does that mean? Like when it's like announced, what negotiations go on? So basically like, that's a kind of, um, I mean, for the official stuff, at least uh, like a timetable, um, which constantly, constantly gets uh, updated. And um, you will see what events are on in which rooms. Um, and I mean, if you, if you would care to, to look closely, there's a bunch of stuff just at, on this, on some day uh, at three o'clock. And you see there's, um, this kind of like shows a bit um, how much is going on in parallel at COP. So there might be um, some negotiations. Actually, this is, this is not so much um, this is many side events actually, because um, there's not just the main negotiations going on, but also um, many things in parallel. So that might be um, just events organized by either preserver organizations or even by the countries. And I want to show you a bit more how that looks like. This is, for example, um, a, more, um, a side event tailored more towards um, basic science and research. So that's, uh, I think that's the IPCC pav pavilion. They, um, so they, in a, I mean, basically in a, in a large hall, there's, there's different pavilions. So I'll show some other pictures where here um, they would organize um, science related talks and bring together other scientists or um, people from policy, you know, people policy makers. And um, I mean, um, have panel discussions, talks or so on. So this is, I mean, a totally different side of uh, what's going on at COP um, during the negotiations. Um, there's um, also, um, I mean, here there's a, there's a pavilion sponsored by Google and Facebook, um, where you might sometimes ask yourself um, whether this is more of a publicity, uh, publicity stunt or, um, or not, but uh, this is also present. There will be like separate talks being organized. Sometimes there's only a couple of people listening in. Um, so they actually sponsored the, um, the uh, pavilion of the, of the UN here. Um, and um, when you go through the halls, um, there's, there can be quite a VIP buzz at some point. So when there might be some, um, some, some head of a delegation, um, and passing through, many journalists will try to get an interview or get some some shots. So this is here now, um, just basically a crossing of, of pathways before the large plenary, plenary halls. And you can see it can get quite busy there um, if something interesting is happening, which is especially in the last days where the tensions become, um, negotiations become a bit more um, more clear um, than 
Um, so you basically have like the most important people being there at the beginning and at the end. So at the beginning, there was a World Leader Summit where I, where I wasn't uh, present, but um, maybe Thomas and Yuming can comment if you're interested. Um, and at the end, um, also many politicians come back again to um, really um, forge these political um, deals then at the end. Um, just two more impressions from the country pavilions. Um, well, so you'll see on the left, for example, the country pavilion of Tuvalu, which um, have this artist's impression of climate change here, which I guess is quite, um, I mean, quite quite striking and and um, shows you really what's what's at stake for the different countries that are in the same in the same plenary, but with very different exposure to climate change already. Um, and so they might have a smaller, smaller pavilion, and then the European Union also has one where they where they feature talks and so on. I think here, yeah, that's one where Nicholas Sturgeon, the, the Scottish, um, um, I think it's called, it's called Prime Minister, um, uh, is now pre present at panel discussion. So all these things are going on in parallel, and depending on where you go, you will have very different exposure, and um, can tailor basically. Um, and our experience at COP was that's why uh, that's for, therefore tailored to what was most relevant for us. Um, so especially um, some of these side talks um, I mentioned here, um, they uh, the different UN organizations will also give these side talks. This is a um, report by the UN Environmental Program UNAP. They um, published an emissions gap report. So especially, basically, um, they were they were showing okay, um, the emissions obviously have to have to decrease, and um, this is not. And they were basically calculating okay, where where are we and what how much is um, missing, and um, or presenting this report to the interested audience at COP. Another thing that's very relevant for COP, um, but uh, which I haven't talked about yet, is the role of um, many NGOs and how they try to influence the policymaking. Um, well, um, well, out of the observers, there also um, obviously many. I mean, everybody cares about climate change, and people have different uh, perspectives on how to how to achieve that. While the observers cannot directly take part in negotiations and um, um, they they might try to influence policymakers, and here um, that was actually a protest by um, German young NGOs, um, which uh, sent a, a signal to Berlin um, that they should uh, go act now about the um, about bringing emissions down in um, in Germany because of the ongoing negotiations for the new coalition government in Germany um, uh, at that moment. Um, so this is all inside of COPS. So everybody here is. Um, has a badge and is at COP um, like us, I mean, observing or a part of the um, negotiation parties. Um, but you see there's this really ongoing influencing of each other, observers trying to raise their voice because they're concerned about something in particular. Um, and then at the same time, policy makes um, negotiating. And here's some just some last impression of Glasgow because at, at, it was actually quite striking how much Glasgow was um, colored and cop um, uh, logos um, all around city center. Um, there was um, there was banners or ads targeting especially cop participants because I mean there was a total of forty thousand people having a badge and these people I mean they were staying in hotels in, in Glasgow, um, commuting by bus to the um, to the event site. Um, so there was. Um, yeah, actually, a lot of targeting these people and sending messages across. So I think it's one. This, this is uh, the world is looking at you at COP twenty six um, to kind of like raise some public public pressure on the negotiating parties. Now, um, maybe yeah. So um, you know, you might ask yourself, okay, but what is um, what's actually the point of of COP twenty six? And that's um, well, that's many things, but one of them is mitigation. That's bringing down the emissions. And I thought, I thought it's quite reasonable to have um, just an update from the climate action tracker, which um, try to project what current policies and action, different targets, um, what kind of climate change scenario they would lead to. And in their November update, which was actually during COP26, they uh, calculate that um, we with, um, I mean, depending on what kind of targets you take into account, 
we have a very small chance of actually still reaching 1.5 degree um, warming scenario. And this 1.5 degree Celsius, that was like the get goal set out from by the um, COP presidency. And um, it was it was barely reached, so to say. So that's um, kind of like we have a, an optimist in the most optimistic scenario. There's currently a um, some chance to reach uh, still reach 1.5 degrees Celsius, um, while current policies and action bring us more towards a three degree um, scenario. Um, in that in that sense, I don't want to. Um, for too long talk about whether COP26 has failed or not. But if we just look at mitigation, um, it um, there's clearly um, still both an emission gap because we are, I mean, there's still too many much emission, but there's also an ambition gap, something that was repeated very often because um, the uh, right now um, we're just barely scratching this possibility of staying within 1.5 degrees. Um, on the maybe more positive note of what climate conferences can achieve, um, it's like a little, maybe a little more uh, a little more uh, complex plot of the Climate Action Tracker, which is uh, an NGO. Um, so they they try to look at what um, did the Paris Agreement, which was an, another um, climate conference, achieve by comparing. Um, the projections of temperature rise um, because of the um, climate change before Paris, the Paris Agreement, which, which leaves us something like, like here. So the Paris Agreement was 2015. And then um, showing how, um, how not just pledges and targets, but also uh, policies and action. So what's actually happening is going down. So um, while these situation is, is of course still dire and we're not, um, we're barely in reach of uh, staying above um, below 1.5 degrees. There is definitely an effect that these conferences have. There's definitely an effect um, that the action, projected action is going down. Now, um, I maybe some, um, some, last, some last comments, I'll stop the share now. Um, from my side before we maybe can open, open this up to a more general discussion. Um, so, um, what, what's really um, maybe important to, to convey here is because we're observing for the Max Planck Society, there's different perspectives that we, that we can take here, how the Max Planck Society can really help in, um, in promoting climate uh, and mitigation efforts. Um, that's because in the Max Planck Society, we have um, some of the leading scientists in climate change. There was a Nobel Prize awarded. Um, just this year for the proof of human-made climate change. So this is some, some um, scientific capital that's within the Max Planck Society. And um, we as observers, we want to be present and show that the Max Planck Society is, is there when, when these events happen. And um, I mean, raise the scientific voice um, in general, and also as a support of the young organizations that are there and doing an extremely important job in, in showing politicians what's at stake and um, how they need to act. But then also it's, it's just important for the Science Society to network with other researchers. Um, I showed you this picture of an IPCC side event. So to be present there um, and uh, then also to have eyes there at the event for, for those not being present um, to show you a bit um, in a, I mean, as, as, transparent, as, as transparently as possible, what's going on at COP, um, what's our impression, and to report back to you. Um, now, maybe very personally, what, what do I think? What do I make out of COP? And then I'm very happy to um, give the word to the others, and we can maybe have some, some perspectives and some discussion. Um, my personal impression was a very, very uh, ambivalent, torn one after leaving COP, because um, it's many things at once, but also it's um, success and failure of COP is very hard to define. Um, there's a feeling of there is um, this it's very important um, to have these kind of climate conferences to bring um, countries together, the countries such as Tuvalu suffering already from um, the warming that we have at the moment, and then which other countries that are more responsible for this uh, for, for climate change. Um, 
but then and then also um, it's it's never enough, right? Everything that's that we do there is always a very important step in the right direction. But um, you saw the the numbers that I showed from the climate action trackers uh, tracker. We're barely in reach of um, uh, keeping uh, of limiting global temperature rise to one point five degrees. So. Um, COP is kind of like a symbol of how doing a lot and going the right direction can still not be enough. So that's, I guess, um, kind of like my, my personal resume after, after the conference. Um, and um, yeah, I think uh, with that, I, I want to finish the, this monologue here and um, maybe um, give to the first other person for maybe some personal thoughts and feelings. And then afterwards, we maybe we can have a discussion, the four of us, um, including some questions from the audience. I don't know who wants to go first. Um, maybe maybe ask JD um, to have uh, some first words from a different perspective, um, and then we can have the others as well. Yeah, thanks a lot for this introduction, first of all. Um, yeah, it's, it's been nice. It's been nice to also witness exactly what you said that basically all of us had a pretty different experience of this of this conference and I can agree to that um yeah I mean we we've been there the whole time together so we kind of realized already on site that our um, perspective how much they like go together and how much they um differ one thing I um for example want to add um is the um participation of Glasgow outside of the venue so this venue, most of what Ben um, now mentioned and talked about happened in this so-called blue zone, which happened, which you were able to access with these badges. Um, and there also was this, um, um, the part of the conference called green zone, um, where public had access, but um, basically the program was um, even more to this advertisement site Ben also just mentioned them um, briefly. Um, and there was also a lot of um, program happening outside of these official venues. There was this um, side event called COP Coalition, COP26 Coalition, organized by the um, public um, society of mostly Glasgow, but also um, UK. Um, so they, they gathered in Glasgow also trying to make this whole experience more um, accessible and more inclusive for those um, people who are not able to get a badge um, through this whole process, um, which had a way more um, activist focus, one could say, but I would say way more um, social change focus. So one thing I, I um, content wise always, um, like from, from day one, uh, I problematized um, on the venues that everybody within this blue zone of the, those um, really um, participating in this dialogue all they um, deal about is money, basically. Um, the, there's a lot of talking about money, about how to transfer money from more developed countries to more developing countries where this um, gaps, ambition gap. And uh, uh, yeah, they, they also like, they had this $100 billion um, dollar plan, which they just don't achieve. And it's a lot of discussion about this. Um, and this um, necess necessity of the social change that is also comes um, from my perspective, definitely with um, uh, the ambition we set ourselves for battling the climate crisis. Um, I think um, it was more discussed outside of this venue, um, in churches, in um, sweet halls and seminar rooms, um, a little more decentralized, beautifully made by, those, by the civil society, basically. And that's um, one major part I want to add to this per perspective that um, especially outside of the blue zone, there was also um, bigger involvement of, of a more activist part of the society. Yeah, um, otherwise, I think um, most of our experiences in the, in the venue were kind of similar. Um, also because we, we shared the same time, so maybe um, I'm also extremely interested um, about the impressions from the first week, how much they differed. Also, I heard the onboarding the process was was kind of hell in the first week um, with all these <laughs> important people coming over. So, um, yeah, I may be also close here for now and uh, leave some space for first week impressions.
Okay, so I can I can jump in, and um, I was there the first uh, for the first week, and um, yes, uh, actually getting to the conference for the first two days was very uh, difficult. It took more than an hour and a half to get in, um, but because there is such a chaos, um, somehow I was. Um, I was wandering into the, the head of uh, a state uh, um, planetary by mistake because uh, as observers that was not allowed, but I would just somehow wandered into that session and I'm um, standing by the door because I saw the, um, I heard that uh, Justin Trudeau was coming out and then a lot of journalists was waiting. And then as I waiting there and patiently and somebody come out and said, hey, who wants to, um, uh, just participate to this uh, head of state the, the last bit and to, to get an impression. So I just raised my hand and I, I got in my, uh, myself in there. And that what happened was that uh, the, the world leader was doing a method pledge for the, uh, uh, for the world. So more than 100 countries participated and signed the, the methane pledge to cut down the methane emission. Um, that was very interesting for me to see how um, different countries the, the 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 pledge to to okay we we know that we have to cut the emissions, um, so that was a kind of bonus like a you know like a because of this chaos that uh, um, somehow I got in there and um, and another thing um, I think I just talk about a little bit my impression when I also accidentally walked into this. Uh, uh, informal negotiation, but uh, observers was was not allowed um, because I was getting I, as I was entering the room, they said, which country you are presenting. Um, and then I said, well, I, Germany. And then all, of course, they look at me, and they're like, Germany. And then um, then they said, then they looked at my badge and they said, oh, no, you're an observer. You can't be here. Um, if you want to listen, you have to go to another room, which is linked to this room. So, so I also went to another room. So I was able to see how this informal um, negotiation um, about the, the climate action um, committee nego negotiated. So um, I can hear both sides of the story. So there was um, developing country and developed country and then the developing countries are all voiced their, their opinion about how, um, in fact, uh, cutting emissions is a, a economic burden for them. So this was something that I I, I thought, okay, yes, um, um, that was I, I understand why it's an economic burden, but uh, um, it's just that uh, I feel like both sides not able to uh, come to the, the the same level of like agreement that um, how we can do this more uh, effectively and also f I think of finance is a big issue for developing country to take on those um, emission cuts because they barely have electricity or heating and so the the obviously wanted to use oil and gas and the the they don't have the money to directly start a more um, sustainable te sustainable technology. So that was a very good um, impression I got from, or also accidentally get into this uh, negotiation, and um, um, and other other events. I I think I just um, did like a Benjamin and um, JD that I I went to the climate action um, event or uh, or side events and um, you know like participated like indigenous people talking about how could you they use their their ancestry um, uh, knowledge to fight climate change, to uh, to keep clean water, and also um, uh, like uh, increase the the power of like a, the women's um, power in this fighting climate change um, situation. So that was also very um, very good experience. Okay, I I, I will stop here and um, I will pass on to Thomas. I believe there's a question. Maybe we can. Yeah, if you prefer, we can uh, head over to a question first. Um, I guess Jakob anyway wanted to ask one, so uh, Jakob, then I would hand over directly to you, and you can you can address your question. Yeah, I <clears throat> I actually didn't want to interrupt your 
procedure. So maybe Thomas, Thomas, you wanted to comment first on in general, but my question would be, I mean, you were there as a delegation of the uh, Max Planck Society. Were there also similar delegations from other science organizations as observers? And more specifically, were there uh, delegations from other um, science organizations in Germany? So I, I, I could answer this question, although I did not meet anyone from Germany, but I know that from my former um, university and um, research institute that there has been uh, colleagues sent to, um, to the, the COP, um, that I also heard the, the uh, Wegener uh, Polar Research Institute in, um, in Bremenhaven, they also sent um, delegations but but I heard that it's all also the the directors went, but the scientists didn't didn't get to go because also everybody is like limited by um by space. Uh, I was actually quite happy that uh, uh, MPG actually chosen that uh, you know like uh, as researchers from um, from different institutes, not uh, not to send our directors to go to the the meeting. Um, I was quite impressed by by. by us that we, we were able to go. Yeah, and I also want to add that um, the network that I'm part of, my research network, the Changing Arctic Ocean, had quite a, a big presence. Uh, and, and that's a um, bilateral um, program between Germany and the UK. Uh, so there are a lot of researchers uh, presenting their, their science. Um, but they are not there as, I mean, Avi was there, but generally, uh, and that's a discussion we can perhaps take later. I, I, um, I think it would be good for future um, cups that Germany has a, a, a stand like that represents science rather than more for commerce, like which is the case of the national German um, uh, booth. But, but anyhow, uh, let me just uh, share some of my impressions. And so I really came there more like a, as a scientist, as a researcher, like being interested in how I, my science research can contribute. Uh, and I'm a particularly interested in food production and nutrition. And it was quite clear that we, we need to have a conversation about like food production, uh, it, like what we eat, that, that's something that needs to be amplified and especially for the global south, for small farmers and stakeholders, because, um, because if we are not gonna take action on the climate change, uh, and mitigation, then the supply chain is going to be destroyed and that's going to lead to more social inequality. And because like the most food insecure people in the world, they, they live in fragile environments and they are prone to climate related disasters. Uh, and, you know, as climate changes, we can expect more frequent and severe stream weather events. And and there's still limited knowledge on, on the impact of climate change and food security and nutrition. Uh, so so we, we need to look at all aspects of food security, including what we eat, like that there are small African farmers saying that, that they're pointing out that animal production is actually quite harmful. I mean, of course, it's a question of scale, so I think the scale of animal production, not only like uh, here in the industrialized north, but also in the global south, it's um, having a severe impact. And uh, and the, it takes way too many resources to produce a certain quantity of, of calories. And, and there's also a need to, to look at locally adapted crop types also including more ancient varieties that are more robust uh, because it's not always like the high yielding crops. I mean, that, that are the most secure 
uh, and they're not the most nutritious. Uh, and 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 how and how does that relate to to climate change and, and mitigation? Well, I mean, one of the ways is that we we need to increase soil fertility um, because that binds more carbon from the atmosphere, but it also enhances the nutritional value. And that's one of the things that there's maybe not enough attention on. That the more CO2 there is in the atmosphere. The faster the plant grows, but the less proteins and, and, and minerals they contain, and that can be partially mitigated by having more fertile soils. And, and, and science has a really important role to play in that, um, because first of all, we need to understand our the baselines, like. Like what's the, the relationship between climate and climate related hazards, food security? Um, and, and a lot of countries, like I mentioned, these uh, parts that are very prone to climate related disasters, a lot of these countries, they don't have enough weather information. So, so farmers, they need weather information. Uh, and information for water management, for forecasting, they need to be open data. And, and these are actually pretty uh, modest investment that will take to, to, to expand this information network that could benefit many small stakeholders. Well, so, so the final part I, I also paid attention to was policies. Um, and it was, well, the, the province speaks more to my own ignorance, but, but it was really an eye opener to me, like how much climate change is related to, to social justice and uh, inequality. Um, so for example, a lot of farmers, uh, they don't have sufficient right to access to land. Uh, and and that worsen their food like their security, but it also but it's very important to engage uh, small uh, stakeholders, farmers, uh, because they can actually um, they, they have the the tools and the knowledge incentive to to engage in more sustainable practices. <clears throat> And, and another uh, aspect, and that's related to, to the finance, that uh, uh, the farmers also lack access to basic technology, they lack access to markets that they can sell the produce to a fair price. Uh, and and so, so a lot of farmers are locked out from this opportunity and the, there's, the supply chains are too long. Uh, so there's still a need for a holistic approach to solving issues. Um, and so, so it, it looks, I mean, th there's a need for supporting like climate smart, sustainable development, uh, and then in the same time, they could reduce poverty and hunger, increase resilience, mitigate uh, climate change, uh, and there's a need for monitoring ecosystems, like from satellites and so on. Uh, I mean, we're already having this in place, but, but that there need to be uh, a global system where ecosystems are monitored closely, and there should be incentives for small stakeholders uh, for looking after the land. And well, one last small thing is that there's always a lot of um, focus that we need to develop new technologies, um, but in fact, a lot of technology is already there. Um, it, it, what is hard is implementing these technologies and scaling them, scaling them up, uh, and that's a big bottleneck. So, so that that was like my take home from from my week there. So, thank you very much, everyone, for for sharing. There is already a couple of questions in the question and answer session. So I would just read them out aloud and whoever feels like they wanna um, answer to this question, just go on. <laughs>
Uh, did any of you follow the negotiations of the Warsaw International Mechanisms for Loss and Damage? Um, either for that specifically or more generally, what was your impression of the negotiations? Which issues were easy to solve versus uh, contentious? Or which parties were moving the conversation forward versus blocking it? It's a very broad question, I guess. Um, I think we will need probably more than one person to answer that. Um, I can try to, a brief answer and then maybe somebody else would like to um, um, add. Um, so I didn't follow personally loss and damage, but um, if I mean, what, what we understand there is um, that loss and damage is obviously the, I mean, one of the most tricky issues because it should basically be called, um, I, don't know, like, rep, I mean, basically somebody break something and somebody else has to pay for it. Um, but this is not how um, more developed countries like to frame it. That's why it's called loss and damages. But I mean, obviously the damage is due to something, due to some cause. But I mean, this is this is kind of like off the table. They have like a, a clear, um, I mean, a clear, like, like a causal link um, there because I mean, also developed countries are afraid to, um, I mean, to be held accountable financially. Um, I mean, basically the outcome was more like um, some, have some um, place for ongoing discussions and so on. So basically it wasn't solved. Um, but um, so um, I think it's maybe more interesting to contrast that with adaptation um, because adaptation, there was um, a commitment to, I think double, double the financial um, resources for that. Um, because I mean, this is something that's, that's easier for developed countries to, to agree on um, to provide means for to build dams and so on because it doesn't bring them into a position um, to be held accountable. Um, so I think that's general, uh, like a general trend where accountability um, is, plays a role. It, it can be a bit tough um, and even countries that are trying to be more progressive uh, such as um, West, I mean, some Western countries lead. I mean, the EU um, is being very vocal, even the US, but still they, they will not provide the, the necessary funds um, to, to that regard. Mm -hmm. But then there are um, more, I mean, more obvious uh, countries blocking progress, um, which is for Australia is one of them. Um, Saudi Arabia is one of them. Um, I think it's a little bit more subtle, maybe when it, that's the last point I want to make uh, when it comes to India and China, at least from my personal perspective. I think they got some blame at the very end um, because there was a phrasing of um, phase out coal, which was changed to phase down coal, which is even softer. But then it's very easy to, to, blame, to blame them for that because they historically they're not, um, they haven't caused it. They're not, the, I mean, if you accumulate the CO2 emissions, and this is what's important, um, they're not, not the reason for that. Um, and the EU and the US, they're, they're not willing to basically pay the money necessary for India to, to uh, cover um, what they would lose financially if they would get rid of coal now. But I mean, that's also a very personal perspective. I think JG raised it, uh, his hand, so maybe. Uh, yeah, yeah um, I, I also didn't focus, um, like didn't really follow on the negotiations on loss and damage. I just um, figured that it was um, pretty sensitive in the end, if it was even included in the, in the reports or not. So there were a few things that were um, played down a lot. And besides loss and dam damage, it was the, the whole topic of fossil fuels, which they also like completely kept out of the whole um of the whole um official um what they what they communicated but uh i thought it like for me it was pretty interesting to see how the developed countries were kind of leading what's on the plate for a discussion so they were kind of setting the frame and within this frame the um mostly uh, mostly positioned themselves as um, g77 plus china states um Kind of, kind of try to to squeeze everything out of this this um, frame. The developed countries, um, mostly European, Northern American um, countries, Australia played a big role. Um, yeah, kind of. Yeah, they are the ones um, who who are supposed to do something. Um, and the other ones are mostly pledging. So I, I think this dynamic was pretty clear to me that um, the, the developed countries were kind of setting the frame in which it was discussed. Um, so yeah, that, that's like what I wanted to add, um, especially in this, this light of um, 
of India being blamed in the end for, you know, also making a point because this was very subtly, very indirectly done the whole two weeks by the by the um, developed countries. Yeah. Someone want to add something on this question? Otherwise, I would continue with the next one. I don't really have anything to add. Actually, um, our head of our delegation, Christina, she's the one actually followed the um, followed the loss and damage very closely because she is her her uh, expertise is also law, and so I think that um, we kind of divided the the um, the the session to cover. So I think that um, she's in the audience, um, but I think she was able to probably report uh, more on that regard. Okay, I mean, she likes to, she can raise her hand. I will happily unmute her and she can comment on this. Otherwise, uh, maybe I'll continue with the next question and then we can see uh, if you would still like to add something on this. Um, so the next question would be, were you able to participate in the negotiations to Article 6 through Ringo? And uh, Melissa also added uh, to that, that uh, if you were in touch with the German delegation on science in Article 6. I, I suppose none of us followed these negotiations and discussions. So sorry, we cannot be much help here. I will say that there are some minutes um, from uh, Ringo participants uh, on, uh, on their website. Um, so, so that's my, my best advice for now. Okay, then thank you for this. And um, then I would just continue with the next question. Uh, were there any things how COP26 was running that show uh, cause sustainable conferencing? Not that it, I expected, but rather to hear if you were anyhow surprised or impressed about, about how it was run. JD, I think you should, you should answer that one. <laughs> so um, one thing I um, want to mention is that they um, added a carbon footprint, for example, on the meals. I think that was a nice gimmick. It didn't didn't really stop people from like choosing very meat and uh, animal product based food. Um, but there was, for example, I think one thing that was um, well done. Besides that, I'm I, like, what comes to my mind is this huge amount of private jets that came for this conference. So I think they're mostly, um, mostly to my mind, come come bad examples on how to not do it. Um, I don't. Yeah, this this. Um, yeah, maybe somebody else wants to to add to that. So I, I can add a few things. Um, I was um, impressed that uh, they give everybody a bottle to, um, to refill water instead of plastic bottles. And they recycle all their um, cups. So it's all reusable cups. Um, um, and um, I, I, I did notice that the meal, um, I think it's more than 50% of vegan vegetarian choices in uh, as 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 far as the claim that that's the choice that you have um so another thing is that uh, when you walk around this pavilion um and you 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 see different pavilion from different country and even saudi arabia and the the give so most of their snack food you can see is there's only one meat like uh, everything else is a vegan vegetarian that was that was surprising um to me so i think everybody's Try to be conscious about it, but I I, I understand this like private jets flying there, um, and um, yeah. Um, but I I have to say I, because I'm a vegetarian as well, so I find it's quite easy to um, get food in the conference. Uh, that was that was um, um, at least a good step, I guess.
anyone wants to add something? I guess also it was nice that most of the stuff was streamed, right? So even you couldn't be there in person, you had the chance to somehow participate in discussions and and so on, right? It was this this kind of hybrid. I don't know if they did it before on the other cops. I was not following this, but uh, at least that's what I realized that you, if you would like to participate and see something, you had a lot of opportunities to to also watch it online and 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 yeah, see what's going on. Yeah, that's true. I mean, I think this meeting was very much a hybrid between virtual and being there in person. There were several meetings, uh, especially in pavilions that I was not able to attend because all the VIPs went in first and then, you know, some of us were left in behind of the queue. And so I just grabbed my laptop and followed the meeting in the background. Uh, um, of course, it's harder to ask questions that way. Um, but, but there's definitely possibility to expand that virtual realm. Uh, and also, so it's more inclusive. Um, I mean, one of the criticisms I heard, like in regards to the pavilions, was that there, there were some there were limited space. It's very expensive, so small NGOs could hardly be there. Uh, there were some small ones in the corner. Um, really nice to talk to them, but it, it's very much elitist, big, powerful organizations that are there. I mean, we saw Benjamin showcase the uh, Facebook, Google's. Uh, Pavilion and, and and I think and, and that's in general that there needs to be a platform where there is already a platform, but but uh, there needs to be it's not only the elite that should have access to to these events and especially the, the young generation, young farmers, uh, NGOs and so on uh, should play a much bigger role. Yeah, I want to quickly quickly add on that. Like that's also my my major criticism on the whole thing. Um, ben showed this um, this picture from the plenary hall. the The first half basically was for the parties. The second half was for these intergovernmental, uh, mostly UN bodies. So this UNFPC and UNABC and blah blah blah. And then basically there was just this last row with like i don't know six or ten maybe seats for these overall organizations for the ngos so like ringo had once one seat one spot the young girls so the youth um non-governmental organizations had one the farmers had one the industry had one and so on but it was like one digit and all the rest was these intergovernmental organizations, all the parties um, that participated in the in the um, in the plenaries. So for me, it was I, I I didn't really feel like I really participate in these negotiations. I didn't really have the chance to participate. I was more like had the chance to see what's happening, and then had the chance to interconnect with other people to um, yeah bring the bring the whole thing in other realms as well. Um, but it was. So some some person once said um, you don't solve this thing with inclusivity by just opening it to more observers because it was as many observers as never before, but then restricting the space they get access to. So that was kind of what what was happening. It was like very classist, very exclusive. Uh, yeah, I mean you you needed to get through all of this process to get this badge at first, which was very very um, yeah it felt like the, the UN just kind of kind of decided in, in advance who to have there and who not and somebody said and this was the first um, COP where the organizers were more afraid by the kids than by the press is and I think this this kind of gives this whole idea of, of, of keeping this separate because they wanted their 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 um, close negotiations and allowed this um ben showed this photo of this um, go act now process which was kind of the closest the process got to this halls um to have yeah the privileged white kids shout um, as loud as they can and this is basically all that like the, the most it got into their holy halls except this very very media heavy um takeover on the last friday where where people still in this blue zone in this exclusive zone um try to you know push into into these panel rooms not not 
by um, force, but by you know announcing previously we're gonna have a plenary there and following the rules, obeying the rules, and just claiming this space. I think from that perspective, it was was really nice. But overall, they they managed quite well to keep it um, quite separate. Yeah. And this is also why I didn't really um, interact with this um, Article Six negotiations, for example, because I didn't feel like, like, I, like besides the fact that it's basically a, again a showcase example for the rich, um, developed countries trying to have their. I mean, Australia and United States don't seem to have any more idea than to buying those certificates. So for everybody who's not into this Paris Agreement stuff and. Um, um, this um, Article Six basically deals with uh, with the um, uh, trade of of um, the emission certificates, right? If I get it right, so that um, some some nations can just buy um, the the um, emission certificates from other yeah, carbon markets is the the um, key word that just came in. So. Um, yeah, there are nations who have no other plan than to buying those um, certificates from other countries and try to to get through all loopholes where both countries can can set those off and things like this. It's just insane. Um, and yeah, there, it was not really about like being being part of this conversation more like um yeah having having eyes in there, which is which is fair, I think, which is already an important step to being able to observe and to to document that there's like what's happening but uh, yeah as it, as it was said the real negotiations were were even um excluded from observers as well so so when the lobbies really tried to push um, this de decisive parties to something um they were just within themselves so yeah thank you very much for this um i think in accordance to the time i would say i would have one short wrap-up questions to all of you. And this includes on one hand, um, so would you go again, for example, next year? And what is your personal take home from COP26 and what are you going to maybe make different now? Or what, what is COP6, COP26 now influencing um, in your, your upcoming research life um, and, and so on? I could start briefly. I think, um... I mean, I didn't need COP26 to, to care about climate change, but it is a different feeling if you're in a plenary where there are all these most affected countries and regions already, I mean, present that are already suffering right now, because for them, climate change is not what's happening in 10, 20 years, but what's happening now. And I think that really does change the perspective a little bit and makes it even more urgent. Um, and this, uh, the second question you had was um, what's maybe for the future. And I think it's, um, I, I mentioned this a bit earlier before, it's really important. Um, I think that as a Max Planck Society and as a delegation, we um, try to um, interact more with the German research um, community in general. And we want to just network with them more and uh, showcase what German science can offer. And I think this is something that we have definitely on our um, on our to-do list and want to push forward for the next COPs, whether it will be some of us there, uh, but it will be definitely somebody for the Max Planck Society there. Okay, I can I can go second. So um, I think in terms of my experience that I, um, um, let me answer the second question first. I, I feel like, um, uh, when I was in the uh, IPCC um, planetary um, report uh, uh, meeting conference that I realized that the outreach is important, extremely even, uh, important how to communicate science to, to a, a, a normal person on the street, how to make them understand the climate change really have an impact on our society and our planet. So I, I feel like um, like I would personally do more outreach. I, I think that's because I'm also a, a sustainability um, group member in our uh, local institute. So that, so that I think that this kind of education um, effort should be continued like um, in a daily basis and how to make our institute more green and more sustainable. I think that's, that should be our continued goal. And um, in terms, um, uh, 
whether we should, I, I would like to go again. I, I, I actually came back, I encouraged all the younger scientists to apply next time because I feel like everybody should have this experience to see uh, uh, views from different sites and, and also how everything is going um, uh, progress or not progress. So I, I, I think regardless, I think that uh, uh, more people should apply for this uh, opportunity and um, uh, because after all, it's an eye-opening experience. Yeah, I can maybe just follow up on that. I agree with this um, eye-opening experience in some regard. So um, for me, it's pretty clear I won't go again also because this is my last month in Max Planck Society actually pretty pretty happy about people like Jakob and Evelyn being here also who guided my um, path quite quite a while so I won't be going again because I probably won't have the chance again um, but I also don't want to go again so I think it's fair I think I'm, I'm very happy I went and I had this uh, impression and this experience but I feel like I don't make a difference there I feel like it's not really giving my, like yeah I, i'm not not um well placed there i, I think it um changed my uh, my perspective on action to a more direct form also so we'll see where it goes but i think um this um, very classist uh and exclusive experience of this conference of parties i had my share um and i think um i'm good to go without from here <laughs> Yeah, if I were to participate again, I, I would come as a scientist. So because I, I, I'm, it can't really help me to to be more determined, uh, redirecting my research towards um, nutrition, food security, um, and mitigating climate change. And I would rather leave my spot to somebody more activist, uh, and so somebody else get that experience. Okay, thank you very, very much, first of all, for being here with us, sharing your experiences and your impressions of COP26. And I think everybody could take something home with them. Um, I'm also uh, definitely agreeing on the, the last comments now in the chat. So with uh, Jakob, for example, so definitely make sure to get active at your institute, making it more green, um, like many of us doing already, but there's always something more that can be done. And there's always something uh, that could be done even better. And I think also that's, that's great that we all work together for the Max Planck Society, but also for other institutes, other uh, opportunities in order to make our life and our, our also work life more sustainable overall. So with this, thank you very much for, for being with us. Thank you very much for presenting. I would quickly hand over once more to Jakob who would give a small, uh, another, um, uh, commercial for, for the Max Planck Sustainability Network and how to sign up and stay in touch with us to not miss any of our following seminars, to watch the recording and all the other stuff which we are doing. Yeah, thank you very much. And um, I hope you can see um, my screen. And um, again, as at the beginning of um, this sustainability seminar, I would like to um, yeah, get involved with us. Uh, there are several different options. If you go on our website, which I just posted into the chat, best is if you already click right now on the link, then because um, after this Zoom seminar, the chat will disappear. If you click now on the link, then it will open up in your browser and you have saved the link. So um, go on our website and um, go on the um, go in the menu to join us and then we have different options how to get involved. Um, if you're not a member of the Max Planck Society, please subscribe to our newsletter. If you're a member of the Max Planck Society and you are interested in our work, then subscribe um, to the newsletter for members of the Max Planck Society. And if you want to get involved, if you want to get a member of the Max Planck Sustainability Network, then please um, click here on the um, membership um, link and then you can um, start um, a registration process for the um, Max Planck Sustainability Network. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jakob. There was just another hand raise, which I would quickly unmute for a question or a comment. Martin, please go ahead.
Martin, you I think that was an accident. Um, <laughs> I don't know what you mean to, but thanks very okay. much. That was really interesting. No worries. <laughs> Okay, then I would say um, thank you very much for being with us. I'm looking forward to see you again. In the end of January, we'll have our next Max Planck Sustainability uh, Seminar. So we'll be January 27 at four o'clock again. So I hope to see you all there again. And I wish you wonderful Christmas, wonderful holidays. Um, keep on doing great work towards sustainability. And uh, with this, thank you very much and see you soon. <laughs>